Building slots. I do want the building slots. Infrastructure is good because there's a 20% production bonus. Although, that's for the Northern Territories. What is there to do in the Northern Territories? Yeah, I thought as much. Northern Territories has no build slots. So it's it's kind of pointless. It will increase the uh, steel production a little bit. But not by a huge amount. So we'll do this for the build slots primarily. And then I think we're going to start working on something else. I'm actually very tempted to go for the Cockatoo Island shipyards. This gets us even more uh, building slots and also three more naval dockyards, which would allow us to put our uh, light cruisers out faster. Our Vickers and Brens come from the Lithgow Small Arms Factory. As it grows, we'll find it easier to increase the fighting capacity. All right. How much does Australia have in terms of population? Our maximum population is 6.6 .6 million. With 1.5 million non-core. Alright, so we got the sonar research done. I'm going to get the active sonar, so we go straight for tier 2s. Save us upgrading to them. And then we're we're very good anti-submarine. We also have another military factory, which we're just going to stick on infantry equipment. We might also want to start recruiting a couple more divisions. I think I'm going to go for cavalry. Just because they are very, very quick. So we'll get those four. We'll save some manpower for ship manning. And we'll get those out. That should secure our borders. The other thing I want to do, and this is just good practice, is I'm going to edit the cavalry division. I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to call this police. And I'm going to give it the police icon, which is the one that I use here. Save. And that's just so that if I'm editing cavalry, it's not going to be screwing with my police forces. And the reason I'm separating that is because we want to set this up. So we go to Occupied Territories. In fact, we have a couple already, so I should have set this up earlier. And we work out how exactly we handle this. So this is more advanced, but still something you need to know. Um, so this is what we have. So we've got Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. These are not core territories. They do require police forces. And as we can see, we're actually deploying some. So I should have done this way earlier. The next thing that I... I'm going to do is I'm going to set these to local autonomy. I don't think we really need a garrison here and I'm just going to automate that. Local autonomy means that the um, compliance will rise automatically. The more compliance you have, the more resources and population you generate from those territories. It's just a good thing to have. This also reduces the amount of defenders that we require. It will reduce the um, resistance averages but by the looks of things there is never going to be resistance here so you kind of do want to open up the the list here this is hard to do when there's no actual resistance this line will push up if there is resistance and then basically the harsher your reaction to the resistance the lower the maximum resistance cap will be but also the slower the compliance growth so generally you want want to try to keep resistance below 25 percent if you can from 25%, it gets much more expensive to reduce resistance. It also starts causing you damage. So generally, you want to be incredibly harsh and then ratchet that down as the autonomy... Um, as the compliance goes up, the max resistance limit goes down. Uh, it's, it's just easier that way. Then we'll just double-check that here. Okay, that's fine. Then the other thing I'm going to do, just because this is a new system and I often forget about it, I'm going to set the default to martial labor. Uh, martial labor. Martial law. So martial law is the harshest um, anti-resistance method without requiring more garrison units. So forced labor will allow you to get more manpower out of a territory. Harsh quotas will allow you to get more resources and factories out of a territory. Huzzah! But they also require a massive amount of extra garrison units and it will reduce compliance growth. Um, so generally martial law is the, the absolute maximum. So we're going to set that as the default. We're going to turn these into local autonomy. And these are basically going to have separate orders. So whenever we take a territory, now in the future, it will automatically be on martial law. So the resistance target is going to go down. Compliance is going to go up. And then we can manually tweak it once I actually remember to do that. Why am I saving political points? Because I forgot they were there. Um... 
because I've just been sitting on speed five. What do I need to get still? We could go for the material designer. Seeing as we've done absolutely no infantry equipment design, we could go for that. The other thing we could do is the New South Wales Railway Company, which will allow us to research tanks faster. No, I think we're going to do this. We're going to go for the infantry equipment designer. Seeing as we've done none of this, this is actually going to be a really good saving. And then after that, I think we might get the either the New South Wales Railway Company or Cockatoo Docks and Engineering. We could also get PHP Steel for faster industry research in the future. Maybe. We'll see. In fact, I think the industry one might be better because we are still actively doing industry. Possibly should have done industry right there instead. It's fine. Newbies, thank you very much for the three month resubscription. Very much appreciate that. Let's hope the notification works this time. I think it did. You know what they say, better sonar than later. Ha, <laughs> very good. What happened to Bannerlord? He's coming back. So for everyone asking about Bannerlord, please just check the schedule. It's it's below. I'm doing one day of Hearts of Iron. Bannerlord will be back, don't worry. This is a variety stream. I do play a variety of different games. Despite what the last month may have looked like. Uh, Normal Funk, thank you very much for the follow. Welcome to the channel. Same with Nconard and Dukman. Thank you very much for the follows. Welcome to the channel. And Sayers, I see you requesting that I drink some tea. I shall do so in a moment. I know, crazy. I play multiple games. Weird, isn't it? I get bored of just one. Not that I'm bored of Bannerlord. I am not bored of Bannerlord. I just had a lot of people requesting Heart of Iron come back. <sighs> Huzzah! Sniper! Thank you very much for the Twitch Prime subscription. Welcome to the Maudlings. Thank you very much for that. Much appreciate the support. Alright, so two more days, one more day, boom. Let's go and get the industrial concern. We're going to go with BHP Steel because there are loads more industrial techs than there are electronics nowadays. Again, since they got... They, they really do need to add something to this again, I think. Ever since they got rid of the... Um, no, what are they called? Encryption, decryption as technologies. This, this just feels really empty. Will it go back to exclusively Bannerlord again? No. From here on out, we are on a variety. But there will still be a lot of Bannerlord. And don't worry about that. I freaking love that game. It's very, 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 very good. But previously, I would do a variety of different games. I'd usually do three or four different ones a week. So we would do um, Hearts of Iron. Various mods for Hearts of Iron. Europa Universalis. Uh, Mountain Blade Warband. XCOM. Civilization. Total War Warhammer, Total War Three Kingdoms, Total War Attila. Um, all of those kind of got nudged aside, Panzer Corps, because of Bannerlord. And now that I'm over that initial excitement, it's taken me a whole month to get to that stage. Usually I do like a week of just one new game, which I really like, and then switch back. So the fact that Bannerlord got a full month is kind of a testament to how much I'm enjoying it. We have a railway that stretches from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs in the north. Now we must extend that northern point to other cities in the area, connecting all of Australia. No, I decided I wasn't going to do that. Because there's no point doing it until we have the Civil Construction Corps, which we can't do until we're at war. Or there's more, well, tension, which there isn't yet. So I think what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to get the Cockatoo Island shipyards for the shipyards and the building slots. And then after that, we'll probably go for the policy of appeasement. The expansion and improvement of the Cockatoo Island shipyards is a major priority for our government. Sydney Harbour is the best access to manpower and resources, and that is where we should focus our naval construction efforts. This is also going to give us a ton of naval experience. Right, I'm going to put you guys back to sea just to finish off your training. I'll probably even watch you doing it, because this ain't going to take long. 
I'm also going to set you to automatic reinforcement and automatic split off, because I just saw you get injured. Go home and repair. In fact, all of you can now. So we're all level 3. That is the icon for level 3. They will not gain experience any further from here. More military factories. More guns! In fact, the other thing we can do with this massive surplus of equipment is send it out as a Lend-Lease. Okay, so we have level 2 sonar. And the anarchists have risen. No carlists yet. I do find that the nationalists are usually quite good at stopping the carlists from rising. So this is a tiny anarchist. Wow. Oh no, they reduced the size, didn't they? I forgot. One of the more recent patches, they split Barcelona in half and the anarchists only rise here. Continued government attempts at reasserting centralised control over the mostly independently acting anarchist communes in the northeastern Spain, as well as the Stalinist repression of dissident communist viewpoints, has now led to full-blown infighting the Republican Front. Initially limited to street fighting and low-scale clashes between the militias and government or the Stalinist forces, the unwillingness for either side to compromise has meant the conflict has rapidly escalated in just a few days. The reallocation of military resources to deal with this internal threat means the front lines against the nationalists have been noticeably weakened. Republicans hardly need outside assistance to lose. Okay, research available. So we got the sonar. We'll deal with that in a minute. I think I'm also going to get the depth charge thrower, tier 2s. I'm not going to bother with the tier 2 destroyer, but I will get the depth charge thrower. And the reasoning for that will become apparent soon. Uh, it is now 37, so we are going to want to start working on concentrated industry 2. Or are we? No, I'm going to wait for the others to research this. We get the max research bonus. We already have improved machine tools at 50%, so we'll go ahead and do that. Pentacore 2 had an update last week. Yeah, I really need to get back into that, but time. France and Britain announce alliance, calling upon the bonds forged during the Great War. France has requested a formal alliance with Britain, citing unspecified threats against the stability of Europe. Today, the request was approved by the British Parliament, and France has joined the Allies. They are preparing for the worst. So we can now see all of the French stuff. Hello, France. In regards to electronics research tree, I think it would be really cool to do away with the tree and instead do something similar to the intel agencies, but with research agencies and projects. That would be cool. Honestly, I think research as a whole could do with an overhaul in this game. I think now research is the weak point. Research and, like, internal politics. As I bought Bannerlord recently, I'll not buy XCOM soon, but I saw some vids and it's definitely on my list. Yeah, Crimea looked good. Not as good as uh, XCOM 2, and I just don't have time for other games at the moment. In fact, there is another one coming out, possibly next week, which I wouldn't mind getting. Have any of you heard of Old World? I think that's what it was called. I'm just going to look at it again. I don't know how I only discovered this yesterday. That. It's made by the same guy that did Civilization 4 and Off-World Trading. Happy Cyberpunk was delayed. Yeah, unfortunately Cyberpunk's not one that I'm going to be able to stream for the same reasons as The Witcher. No, I hadn't heard of that. Neither had I. That flew so under my radar, and considering how engaged I usually am with um, Grand Strategy and strategy titles in general, that is quite amazing that that flew completely under my radar. And it's in early access next week. Yeah, I saw Arumba's playing it at the moment. I just hadn't heard of it. Have I considered a great war mod for Heart of Iron 4? I played quite a lot of it. There are even videos of it over on YouTube, which you can find at youtube.com slash Viking. There's at least a Germany playthrough. Possibly one or two others. Like, I've played quite a bit. And actually, there is something which I am under NDA for, but I think I can say is next Friday I'm going to be doing something very cool and very Hearts of Iron related. I am really excited about it, so next Friday, stay tuned. I'll be announcing more details about that soon. 
Um, but it's it's something really cool, and I'm very very excited for it. Uh, very different as well. Should be good. I'm being as cryptic as I possibly can be. Uh, what I can probably say actually is that it's related to um, VE Day, which is on Friday. The Hindenburg incident disaster was narrowly averted today when the diesel fuel leak was discovered on the German passenger airship Hindenburg as it came into dock with the Lakehurst Naval Air Station in the United States. The leak was promptly repaired. Had it gone unnoticed, flammable vapour could have resulted in a fire that would have engulfed the entire airship. Critics have long questioned the wisdom of passenger airships given their spotty safety records, and this incident is bound to make them even more vocal. Close call. Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong have issued a joint announcement, declaring that they have set aside their differences in the face of the Japanese attack. Uh, both sides will observe a strict policy of non-aggression against each other for as long as the war against Japan lasts, and have vowed to do everything in their power to throw back the invader. A number of smaller warlords have also declared their support, putting their forces under the command of Chiang Kai-shek. Oh, you know something I could do? I could send guns to China, and basically use that to delay Japan. With tensions rising around the globe, the US Congress has seen, been the scene of intense discussions about the role the United States should play on the world stage. Many members are concerned that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt might secretly be planning to intervene in a European or Asian war. Some still remember the role the country played in the Great War, and are anxious to keep the United States out of foreign entanglements. Eager to shore up support for his proposed programs of economic reform, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt has signed the Neutrality Act into law, which places heavy restrictions on trade with the nations at war, and specifically prohibits the President from offering any kind of support to other nations. Let's ask the Belgians just how well neutrality defended them in 1914. Ooh. Attaches, how do they work? I'll be honest, I don't really use attaches, they're too expensive. Early today, China and Xinjiang issued a joint statement about the latter as being formally granted in status and then to the Chinese United Front. But basically what you can do is you can spend a ridiculous amount of political power and command power to send an attaché. That will increase the fighting abilities marginally of the nation you send the attaché to, and you generate a proportion of their military experience, which will allow you to change your uh, templates early on. But considering it costs 100 political power, it's I always feel like it's just too expensive. Um, right. Just seeing vaguely what these do. Recruitable population goes up. Logistics companies. Nothing there for motorized. I think it is time for us to get involved in politics. Support the policy of appeasement. The costs of the last war still weigh heavily on the national memory. If taking territorial concessions half a world away can keep Australia out of war, then we should certainly consider these concessions. This also gives us a 3% sharing bonus from Commonwealth Research. Does that mean we can go up to 53%? Or is that just a base 3% we can always get? I don't know how that works. So we'll de uh, deploy the cavalry. I'm going to press Shift K, which is the hotkey for the training. And it will end once they're fully trained. And we'll just let you fan out and go and defend. You also get war support with an attaché. Oh, that I didn't know. Attaché is a good multiplayer when you're sending volunteers to another player because the attaché gets you access to see all of their forces. That's true. Yeah, you can see the positioning of enemy or of troops. Your own, the troops that you're sending the attaché to. Right. Um, we still don't have all of the tech bonuses for concentrated industry nor fuel refining, so I'm going to hold off of those. We do have the. Oh, hang on. We can get. Another one of these now. Um, we have steel. We have material. Let's get the tank designer. 
I really need to get started on the doctrine. I think I'm going to start on the naval doctrines. Okay, so talking naval doctrines, there are three choices. Fleet in being, trade interdiction, and base strike. Fleet in being is the general, casual, highly versatile doctrine. If you're not taking trade interdiction or base strike, you should basically just default to fleet in being. It's very strong. It's very good. Um, the big thing about fleet in being is your big ships are going to be better. So your battleships in particular are very effective. Uh, less so with battle cruisers. Battle cruisers, I think, are actually boosted more from trade interdiction and heavy cruisers. Same thing, trade interdiction. Uh, the other big thing about fleet in being is your destroyers become very, very strong. And fleet in being has the best convoy escort bonuses in the game. They are very good at detecting submarines, they're very good at destroying submarines and protecting your convoys. Um, your submarines also aren't bad, like completely viable, you absolutely can use them. Not as good as the trade interdiction subs, but they're not far off. The one thing which does suck for fleet and being is carriers. So if you're fleet and being, don't use carriers, they're not very good. Then we've got trade interdiction. Trade interdiction is really good if you're not expecting to import anything. If you're in expecting to have to import anything overseas, you want to avoid this. Because trade interdiction's uh, convoy escorts suck. They are really bad. So if you need to protect any kind of convoys moving around, don't take trade interdiction. Fleet and being would do you a lot better. Trade interdiction, however, does have amazing submarines. Their submarines are very, very strong. They also are very good at um, raiding. So even their surface ships can do good raids, although it is further down the tech tree, like here. Battle cruiser, surface detection, raiding efficiency, organization, etc. So you do need to go a fair way down to get the surface raiding abilities, um, but they are good. So if trade interdiction is just if you want to screw with others. Germany. Classic Germany going after Britain. And then base strike. Base strike is the carrier doctrine. The light cruisers of base strike are very strong, which is why I was kind of going, do I want base strike? I might do. Because base strikes, light cruisers are very good, but fleet and being is close. Um, base strike also has the best carriers, by far and away. If you're using carriers in any shape or form, base strike. That's the United States and Japan. Um, we don't have the capacity for carriers. We are almost certainly going to go in fleet and being, but the, the better light cruisers is very tempting. Uh, Base Strike does have decent convoy escort. They do have decent submarines. They do everything decently, just not as decently as fleet and being. They are very much carrier specialist, and they don't have the massive downsides that trade interdiction has. Um... The light cruisers are good. But I can basically ignore this side. Oh, the other thing with base strike, which is kind of interesting, is if you intend to do nothing naval, but you are being hurt by enemy navies, again, possibly like Germany, possibly like Siam, or maybe Soviets, then you can get the first one only, which does give you a plus 50% port strike. That counts for land-based aircraft. So you can use land-based naval bombers to bomb enemy ports where they are repairing stuff and you will do it more effectively. So if you are being plagued by enemy navies and you just don't stand a chance of like fighting their navies toe-to-toe, -to -toe, just take the first level of base strike, build up naval bombers and you should be more effective. Um, but yeah, we're going to go fleet and being. I think... Now, here's the choice. I don't have submarines, so this branch at the moment is useless. We might investigate that a little bit later. We are planning to do destroyer subdetection. And Japan does start with a fair number of subs. So I think we're going to take convoy sailing. We're just going to worry about keeping our lines of communication open. This is also going to help us uh, protect the, uh, the Dutch against Japanese submarines, which do plague this area early on in the war. They do tend to get sunk pretty quickly. Japanese submarines aren't particularly good. Um, particularly if we're focusing on sinking them. Right. Uh, did we finish researching depth charges? Not yet. Where are we with aircraft designs? So we are going to want scout planes. Definitely. We're going to want fighters. We're going to want close air support. So with the Commonwealth Air Force bonuses... We're going to need to have both of these up to date. So the boomerang is the fighter. 
So we probably do want to have the research company for the boomerangs, and if nothing else, we can export them to Britain and let Britain use their manpower to use them. But again, that's another thing we do have to research. That's building dockyards, which we might start doing. Let's just take a quick look at this. Naval reformer is experience gain, decisive battle is screen attack, and capital ship attack. So, Jack, Crace, and Fleeting Being, great combo. That's going to work really nicely for us. A genius infantry commander. Interesting. 20% infantry division defense. Oof. We're also going to have decent artillery. I mean, artillery is something we'll probably bring in later. Good capital ship. We have a lot of cap ship bonuses. Not necessarily from the construction, but from our commanders they are. Hmm. Japanese do have bonuses to their torpedoes. Fine. They're still really weak subs, though, and usually easily detected. Never really understood how to use carriers effectively. They just seem way too costly to me. I, I almost never use them. Same as attaches. Attaches and carriers are two things in this game I've just generally avoided. Doctrines represented by countries. Fleet in being is the UK and Italy. Trade interdictions Germany and base strikers the USA. And Japan. In fact, I would even say base strikers more Japan than USA. Like the plus 50% port strike, which is, um, oh yeah, Pearl Harbor. Am I going to get naval bombers and try to hunt the Japanese Navy that way too? Undecided, considering how good our, navy, our air force is going to be, possibly, but all of my bonuses are to um, close air support. We'll see. We'll see. The problem with air forces, they do tend to be manpower intensive. What's the most important national focus here? Uh, political, industrial, research, or military? Was build one up to very good levels, but the others suffer. I mean, I almost always focus industry and then others. It really depends on your nation, though. That, that's a very difficult one to say you must do this first. But generally, as a general rule, industry first. God tier trolling from Ubisoft. They have a live stream on YouTube that's been going for six hours titled Assassin's Creed Teaser. It's nothing but a guy using Photoshops to paint a cover poster style image. Well, I mean, as the image becomes more obvious, I guess that would be a teaser for probably for the next Assassin's Creed. Like what era or what location it is. Can cast do port strikes? Yes, they can, just not as effectively. Base strike is Pearl Harbor, Coffs in Toronto. True. The British did do it first. Could you use heavy cruisers for capitals? Okay, so here's a question, which will require a little bit of research, because I am never sure about the benefit of heavy cruisers. I want to do... Uh, this is actually going to be difficult with the way that they have arranged this now. 